Um, let's crack on because we have a lot of time. I'm afraid I need a quarter, uh, formally, at the, or here, formally known as Monday Health. Um, this is on uh, uh, the problem of borders uh, from Brexit and barriers. Um, we're taking back control of our laws, our money, and our borders. That's a mantra that uh, Theresa May has been using really uh, since uh, the Brexit uh, referendum. And it's, um, it's taken a rather disturbing turn uh, at the latest Tory party conference. There's always been um, a kind of ambivalence about this kind of borders because in some respects, the UK government's line has been that we don't need borders. It doesn't need to be a border in Ireland. They often say it's just a fiction. Uh, or else they say that it's the European Union that's wanting to impose uh, a hard border in Ireland. They don't want to have a border. Um, what's the point of it? Um, and this has kind of now acquired a rather sinister tone because the rhetoric has increasingly been one of annexation and a suggestion that in some way the European Union is trying to break up the United Kingdom by extracting, by taking Northern Ireland away from the rest of the UK by enforcing this uh, backstop. So uh, obviously this is a very uh, delicate issue and it's disturbing that the rhetoric has moved along these lines, talking about the EU as a prison camp or comparing it with the Soviet Union, saying that Britain is in some way in chains. But um, borders are obviously sites of conflict um, and everyone here knows that only too well and Arlene Foster has conveniently reminded us by talking about blood red lines but we hear today that uh, from sources close to Michel, Michael Barnier's office that there is going to be uh, a deal, or at any rate, they're very close to a divorce deal, which we're told, as I say, this is just today, we're told is supposedly based on a kind of hybrid backstop, that the backstop would be, uh, there would be assurances that the Irish backstop would continue, there would be no, no uh, hard border in Ireland. In exchange for that, Britain as a whole would remain in the customs union, at least uh, for a period until a trade settlement has been decided um, and there would be some kind of max fact, there would be some kind of uh, technological solution to regulatory and customs checks in the North Sea, in the Irish Sea. So anyway, they, um, that we'll obviously discuss whether that, that's, that's feasible. We have a very learned uh, panel uh, uh, here on the, on the far left, Dr. Nikolai von Darza, who's the Deputy Head of the uh, EU, research, EU Research Unit at the Stiftung Wissenschaft und Politik, SWP. He's also a lecturer in European Studies in Berlin Universities. Uh, then we have uh, uh, second from my left, Paul Gillespie, who is formerly Foreign Policy Editor of the Irish Times, now Deputy Director of the Institute of uh, British and Irish Studies at University College Dublin. My immediate left is Dr. Katie Hayward, who's a reader in sociology at Queen's University Belfast, a fellow in the George Mitchell Institute for Global Peace, Security and Justice, and she's also a member of the Centre for Research into International Borders. And on uh, Dr. Nikolai's right is Dr. Eve Hepburn. She's founder, director of the Edinburgh-based policy Scribe, a research consultancy uh, and she was a former a senior lecturer in politics at Edinburgh University and has written very extensively on EU affairs. I think I'm going to ask um, Katie Hayward, uh, since she is uh, so, uh, she obviously uh, been researching questions of international borders, to maybe kick us off today. If you'd like, they're going to speak for about five minutes or so each, and then we'll throw it open to the floor. So I'll give you Katie Hayward. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the invitation to be here. I'm sorry I missed, missed um, much of the event so far due to teaching this morning and relying on the Enterprise train to get down here <laughs> at speed, but uh, it's very good to be here. Um, what I'm going to do, I'm not really going to talk about borders actually so much, but just have a little reflection on where we are at the moment. And uh, there's a lot of speculation about what the UK might or might not propose next week. Um, and then uh, just to kind of frame the issues in relation to the border, and then I'm sure we'll um, have an interesting discussion afterwards. So I'm going to talk about the three key high-level problems that perhaps we haven't necessarily thought about or identified for some time, the question of what the UK's choice is right now uh, at this moment, and then what the UK might propose. Um, and I'm going to try and do it as succinctly as possible. So the first problem that we have, that we're all actually really aware of, is the fact that the UK and the EU do not agree where we are right now. They don't even agree what we're negotiating 
For the UK, it's very much about the future. It's all focused on the future relationship. For the EU, of course, it's about the divorce. It's about the withdrawal agreement. And I think um, the UK has not made it clear at all, even to members of the, the, the UK government, uh, the realities of what can be um, agreed or decided regarding the future relationship. That's a critical issue. The second key problem is almost ironic. So both the UK and the EU um, agree that they want a backstop, that has to be a backstop, and they both agree that they don't want to have to use it. Um, so far, so good. But the problem is, of course, that only the backstop will be legally binding and enforceable. The future declaration will not be. Um, and there's some sort of tension, therefore, in that. Um, given that the thing that they don't want to have to use is the only thing that we're going to have in legally enforceable text by, the, by March 29th, hopefully. And then the, the third problem is one that's facing Theresa May most definitely. Um, bear in mind, both the withdrawal agreement and the future declaration will be coming to the House of Commons for a meaningful vote. Um, and they're both voted on separately. Um, to get this through, May will need either Labour Party support or the DUP and the ERG to have their support. We can pretty much discount the possibility of having Labour support. They're pretty much saying that they won't vote against anything at all because the withdrawal agreement is unlikely to give them the kind of detail and specifics that they need or certainly won't be specific in a way that they would like to see the UK going. So then we come to the DUP and ERG and this is a really interesting problem because the DUP and ERG sit at the same table um, and they can use the same kind of language, but that it only goes so far. They can only do that insofar as they do not address the realities of what the Irish border problem is. They can only do that so, so long as they can dismiss the consequences of leaving the European Union for the Irish border and for Northern Ireland in particular. So if they're faced with those realities, as May is now, um, we have to look at what the DUP and the ERG want, and they want very different things. The DUP wants an all-UK solution that will have to, if you're looking at how to avoid a hard border, that will have to include customs union, that will have to include single market to some degree, or at least, if you like, following a common rule book, whatever that might mean. That's what the DUP needs. The ERG, of course, does not want that. It wants the UK to be able to do its own deals and to be able to diverge. So those are very different things. So May is unlikely to present anything that will be um, equally pleasing to the two of them. Who is she going to end up pleasing? Well, judging by what we're hearing at the moment, she's not lining things up to please the DUP. They are, um, they are, their interventions recently seem that they're not preparing the ground for Northern Ireland-specific arrangements. Even though we have known that Northern Ireland-specific arrangements are, are coming, because we've seen what's agreed so far in the, in the protocol, and we saw that in the joint report, and we've seen it in the UK white paper. So Northern Ireland specific arrangements coming, the DUP aren't preparing the ground for that. Um, they're almost settling into the comfortable last ditch, and that comfortable last ditch is voting against whatever she brings to Parliament. The second point I want to address is what the UK's choice is now. So it, we, can, um, we can imagine that in Downing Street they're facing this decision. Do they seize the moment now and put forward an all-UK backstop, um, all-UK proposal in relation to the backstop, most specifically on customs union, and then allow for some regulatory alignment for Northern Ireland in particular. This could be announced next week. The shorter the time between announcing it and the, and the EU Council summit, the better. Allowing a special summit in November and um, coming to Parliament uh, fairly rapidly after that. Or they can play the long game or they think they can play the long game, take it to the wire, possibly December or even January, in the hope of staring down the DUP and ERG and indeed the EU. Um, the problem is, of course, that to do so, the threat behind that would be the, the threat of a no deal. The problem is that neither the EU nor the DUP and ERG really are frightened of a no deal to the same extent as the UK government ought to be. Um, so it really is not going, is really unlikely to work. And even if she did try and set them down and put them into a corner that way, we could still be pretty sure the DUP would vote against, um, unless they're offered something. That's another matter. And then finally, the UK proposal that might be put forward, and there's some speculation about it being put forward. Um, and perhaps a note of caution on this, 
Um, we saw yesterday how British media responded to um, to uh, Tusk's tweet about Canada plus plus plus, and this idea that all oh, this could all be on the table, this could be possible. Obviously, they've been saying that for 18 months or more. Um, but we, on the other side, we can also get a little bit um, in the realms of speculation by expecting the UK to present something next week. What, is, what are the evidence that they will, uh, and what are the evidence that it will be an all-UK thing? Actually, there's very little evidence of that, so just a note of caution on that. Anyway, if it was an all-UK customs union proposal, there's a real problem there. And that is, of course, that getting the all-UK and all-UK arrangement into the withdrawal agreement isn't possible. And I stand to be corrected by legal experts in the room. But the withdrawal agreement, of course, is about Article 50, the future relationship, the future uh, trade agreements. That'll be when you can have Article 216 in play. So there's a problem in getting an all-UK issue into... Um, into the withdrawal agreement. The reason why the protocol can deal with Northern Ireland uh, specifically and talk about the future is, of course, because of Ireland's position. And all of these issues are seen to be in relation to Ireland and the consequences of Ireland as a member state of the UK's withdrawal. Um, so an all-UK arrangement anyway would have to be in the future declaration, which, as we noted at the start, isn't legally enforceable. Is there a way around this conundrum? Um, there's always a way. Uh, one solution could be to make the wording in the future declaration as close as possible to that in the protocol, uh, in the backstop, so they almost mirror each other. So when they come before the parliament, they are seen to be closely entwined, uh, entwined and, and twinned in that way. Possibly, there's a possibility of getting something into the preamble which wouldn't have the same status as the protocol text itself. One last point. Uh, we haven't yet seen anything about the future declaration, this really vital document. We, don't, we haven't seen any drafts, we don't know how long it might be, etc. Barnier has told a, a German newspaper that it may be 15 to 20 pages. Um, we don't want it to be too vague, because then it will um, um, be, um, could go in either direction after, after the date. Um, we do expect a draft from uh, the EU next week, it's on the College of Commissioners agenda for the 17th of October. When we see that text, then we'll be much more enlightened, um, at least about one side's view of what that future relationship might look like. Thank you. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak. I want to look uh, in the longer term, uh, uh, reflecting work that we've done here in the Institute uh, uh, in, our, uh, in our work on the UK and Europe and on Brexit, and work that I'm doing also in the Institute of British Irish Studies in UCD. Uh, if you look at the entanglement between the internal and external aspects of the uh, Brexit crisis affecting Britain. It's extraordinary that it's now out in the political domain, that you have the Prime Minister talking about the breakup, potential breakup of the political system uh, in relation directly to Brexit. This is something we have analysed in, in our work in the Institute for quite a long time. Uh, we foresaw that these uh, issues are linked in what we described as a dual sovereignty crisis. I want to just explore some of the uh, ramifications of that as they affect borders. Uh, and I think this is a really important aspect in the preparation for the immediate outcomes, which are so uncertain, as we've heard. I want to look in, the, uh, in, in rather longer term. And this involves constitutional change and constitutional futures uh, in Britain and Ireland, and as they both relate uh, to the future of the European Union. Um, the issue has been described by one analyst, Jennifer Todd, as a potential constitutional moment facing us in Ireland and Britain uh, in, 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 about these futures. Uh, and that goes back to the linkage between the uh, crisis externally vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the EU and the crisis internally vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the uh, relationship between London and its constituent nations and the way that's arranged. And that's a sovereignty crisis. Uh, and it affects Ireland very profoundly uh, and is only recently being properly uh, registered in our political debates. Um, the work that we are doing in, in uh, IBIS and UCD tries to understand what's driving uh, these changes in the UK, in this 
what's been described as a dysfunctional political system, uh, and which also have driven Brexit. And of course, the outcomes, depending on, uh, 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 on, 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 uh, on events, are going to be some of the following. And I'm trying to work on identifying the drivers of these change so that we can get a more rational discussion about how, uh, how some of the constitutional futures that might arise. A softer or a harder Brexit outcome is obviously one of the major axes of change. Uh, and we've heard in our discussion just how uncertain uh, and complex that matter is. It relates to absolute or shared sovereignty, the whole question of a multi-level uh, system of integration at national and uh, EU and European level uh, revolves around that uh, question of sovereignty. And a lot of the Brexit discourse is to do with the uh, resurrection of a very old-fashioned sense of absolute sovereignty, as distinct from the shared sovereignty that we're used to, including in the Belfast Agreement. That, in turn, relates to devolved or centralised political control in the UK system, very much an issue uh, for, uh, for Scotland, but also very much an issue in the north of Ireland. And that, in turn, relates to this question of shared or exclusive national or British political identities. Uh, political scientists try trying to understand some of the drivers of change here uh, identify, uh, for example, an exclusive English identity as being one of the major uh, correlates of, of, of voting for Brexit. And that also relates, at a more elite level, to imperial or post-imperial ideologies of political power there. Uh, and it relates, in turn, to the real or perceived political economy effects of a harder or softer Brexit that really is coming home to people much more uh, uh, as they come closer to these decisions. And finally, you have the wider geopolitical, transatlantic and European effects. And if one is to try and understand the linkage between these elements, one has perhaps a better understanding and a better way of approaching the forthcoming political decisions we're going to have to make on the island of Ireland about the evolution of these events. And they seem to me to be four, and I'm just going to sketch these uh, very briefly in, in character. We want, you could first of all have, with presumably a softer Brexit, a renewal of existing north-south structures of, of the Belfast Agreement after Brexit, requiring renewal, too, of the institutional relations in the east-west setting. They're going to have to be reconstructed and reorganised, assuming Brexit happens. Secondly, will that happen by way of a deeper federalisation in the UK, which would head off uh, a number of the pressures? Uh, and would, how would that come? Would it be with a softer Brexit? Conceivably, would, could it be with a Labour Party uh, or a Labour coalition uh, type of government? Thirdly, you might foresee a differentiated outcome uh, where you have Scotland uh, with particular arrangements, Northern Ireland with particular arrangements, and again, a bedding down uh, of a, a more stable political system in the UK. Or fourthly, a, f a very plausible potential outcome would be Irish reunification within the EU, which would have to be considered alongside Scottish independence and a new constitutional settlement in England and Wales, all of which would relate distinctively to each other uh, and to the EU. Now, this last outcome is, is very plausible, you may say more, made more likely by these events, but certainly whatever way you identify that, uh, it needs a lot more deliberation and argument and discussion and research uh, than, it's, than it's had so far. And I just want to flag that as some of the emergent issues from the, the Brexit crisis and say that some of us are trying to grapple with this and would very much welcome uh, uh, observations or discussion about how to handle it. It's no longer an issue arising out of the traditional irredentist Irish nationalism, rather does it arise out of this structure crisis in our big neighbour and how uh, that relates to us and to our common futures vis-a-vis uh, -vis the European Union. Thank you. Dr. Eve Hepburn. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me here. So as I'm sure you're all aware, um, in the last few days, immigration has re-emerged as a key battleground in the Brexit negotiations in the British media, although, of course, it never went away. 
at the Tory party conference earlier this week, Theresa May and her Home Secretary, Sajid Javid, have finally started to outline what a post-Brexit immigration system might actually look like. And their recommendations are very much in line with a report by the Migration Advisory Committee, which came out a couple of weeks ago. So in the next five minutes, I've been asked to focus on the UK-EU border by focusing on the main headlines of these proposals and then by talking about the wider implications of these immigration plans for the labour market in the UK, citizenship rights and relations with the EU. So what are the main headlines in these new UK immigration proposals? Here are the big four. First, we're going to see the end of freedom of movement. So currently, any citizen of an EU member state can come and live and work in the UK. But post-Brexit, EU citizens will be given no preference, and they'll have to apply, like third country nationals, uh, through the UK's visa system. Equally, any employer who wants to hire an EU worker will have to go through the bureaucracy of the points-based system, as well as paying a £1,000 skills charge each year, which is quite a lot of money for small and medium-sized enterprises. Second, we're going to see a bias towards high-skilled, high-paid labour. EU workers will only be able to apply um, through the high-skilled Tier 2 route, um, which has recently become known for its high rejection rate. As a concession, Javid said he plans to scrap the current cap on Tier 2 migrants, which is just over 20,000 a year, and he's also expanding the eligible list of um, medium-skilled jobs. But the rub is that applicants will have to meet a minimum salary threshold, which currently stands at £30,000 a year. So in short, any EU worker in the future not making £30,000 a year, which is currently about 75% of EU workers in the UK, they'll find it very difficult to come to the UK in the future. Third, we're going to see a massive decline in low-skilled migrants coming to the UK. Javid and May have said they won't open up Tier 3, which is the unskilled route, as they wish to deter low-skilled labour. The only exception is agriculture. Uh, a few weeks ago, the government talked about a, a seasonal, um, work, seasonal agricultural workers pilot scheme that will come in next year, although farmers' unions say that's not enough. Now, this move uh, to reduce low-skilled labour is a popular political move rather than an economic one. The Brexit referendum was motivated by anti-immigrant sentiment, especially the feeling that low-skilled ma migrant labour was stealing British jobs. However, it is a potentially catastrophic economic move, which I'll speak about in a second. Fourth, we're going to see the end of European citizenship in the UK. This is not being talked about enough. So Brits will no longer have access to the multiple benefits of, um, afforded to them by EU membership, um, to live and work in other EU countries, voting rights, legal protections, EU law, European health insurance card. And equally, EU nationals will face increased obstacles to obtain rights in the UK because Javid has started talking about creating a more restrictive British values test that all future citizens, including EU um, citizens, will have to meet. So what are the main implications of these proposals? I like to talk about eight different issues. I'll go through them as quickly as I can. First, we're going to see massive labour shortages in key sectors of the UK economy. Businesses have been up in arms at the proposals to slash low-skilled migration, which will drastically reduce the number of workers able to do these jobs. Industries that are going to be hard hit will be the social care sector, hospitality, <coughs> construction and health. And the effects of these labour shortages are quite difficult to imagine, but potentially include a drastic reduction in house building in the future, despite existing shortages, a reduction of the number of people looking after the elderly, leading to massive issues in their health care, the closure of a number of hotels and restaurants across the country due to the lack of staff, and increases in food prices and potentially food shortages if farmers are unable to hire um, farm workers. Second, linked to that, um, it's possible we're going to see a tax rise as the number of EU workers decline in the UK. And that's because EU migrant workers, on average, contribute £2,300 more per head to the UK purse than the average British citizen. So that eases the tax burden on other taxpayers. So if we see a reduction in EU workers who are making this positive contribution to the UK's public finances, the tax burden on others is going to have to rise. 
Third, in the longer term, we could see a potential drop in the demographic growth of some regions and nations in the UK that are heavily reliant on EU uh, migrants to maintain their current population rates. So I'm thinking here of Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. So slower population growth will put pressure on the current workforce, especially young people who are a shrinking demographic anyway, to support people of pensionable age, and that's going to have an effect on the economic growth as well. Fourth, Javid has also started talking about increasing barriers to naturalisation by toughening up citizenship rules, such as the new British values test and tougher English language requirements that future EU applicants will have to pass. This continues a trend towards coercive civic integration policies in the UK, where migrants are being held responsible for their own integration or lack thereof. Fifth, and linked to that, uh, we're likely to see continuing hostility towards migrants in the UK, which has increased since the referendum two years ago. These immigration proposals have done very little to create a positive rhetoric about the contribution of migrants to the UK. In fact, May again was talking this week about the importance of reducing migrants and how she didn't want migrants competing with locals. And Javid started talking about creating a safe home by ending freedom of movement. Now, this type of statement, which links immigration with a lack of safety, um, tends to drive public fear and hostility towards migrants. Sixth, we're going to have an overloaded home office once we add EU migrants to the current Tier 2 system, a system that is already painfully strained with massive backlogs, notoriously long waiting times, and multiple mistakes being made. And Windrush is one example of this. So adding EU migrants to Tier 2 without massively expanding the capacity of the Home Office um, will likely cause delays in applications, which may result in firms losing out um, as um, EU migrants will possibly move to another country in the single market where they can more easily apply for jobs. Seventh, we're starting to see a retaliation in kind from the EU. Um, who are dismayed by May and Javid's proposals to restrict future EU migrant flows to high-skilled only. So the European Parliament's Brexit negotiator, Guy Verhofstadt, has warned that UK nationals living in the EU will suffer if the UK introduces a system that discriminates against EU citizens. So we may see Brits abroad losing their rights. I just want to briefly touch on what discrimination means, because we know that prior to 2004 and the large then, EU nationals from the older member states tended to fill highly skilled positions. But since 2004, we know that EU migrants from the new member states have tended to fill low skilled positions, even though they're often vastly overqualified. So in essence, by cutting routes to low skilled migration, this is going to have a disproportionately negative effect effect on um, nationals from Central and Eastern Europe um, who have tended to fill these crucial sectors and, and low-skilled sectors such as care, hospitality and agriculture. Finally, eighth, we are likely to see an increase in constitutional tensions amongst the constituent nations of the UK. The MAC report, Javid and May have refused to take into account, for instance, the Scottish Government's extensive research and policy recommendations to introduce a degree of flexibility into the UK's immigration system to account for sub-state variation. Javid has talked about implementing a single system, but research has shown time and time again that migrant flows and needs are very different in different parts of the UK economy. And given that Scotland has already voted in favour of remaining within the EU, and that a drastic reduction in EU workers to Scotland is going to affect its population growth and economic growth, this will likely meet with anger and defiance from the SNP-controlled Scottish Government, potentially fueling a second independence referendum with it, the breakup of Britain. Thank you.
Yes, thank you very much. Thank you also to uh, the organizer for inviting me. It's uh, for me also a great pleasure to be here today. And I have to start, unfortunately, with a short excuse. I think one of the most used phrases in the Brexit negotiation is time is ticking. Uh, for me, that's actually quite literally true. The last plane to Berlin uh, starts at quarter to six. So um, what I don't like to do is I have to leave immediately after this session. Um, but I hope I can still bring you my perspective from, from Berlin on the border question and where we stand in the negotiations. And I think uh, something that at least is always in the British debate, and we hear it even uh, from so-called pro-Europeans in the UK debate, is that eventually there will come the point where Germany and France will throw Ireland, so to say, under the bus. Uh, on the, on the uh, border questions. And I think the first message that I would like to give uh, from, from Berlin is how ingrained the, the Northern Irish question has become in the, Brit in the Berlin debate um, on Brexit and how much importance Germany puts on, on that question. And I think uh, this on the one hand is uh, of course uh, a question of solidarity with an EU member state. But I think it's also a question of core national interest. And the core national interest of Germany in the Brexit negotiation is safeguarding the cohesion of the EU27 and the single market. And the realization early on, and I would say after the immediate shock of the, of the referendum in the UK, was that the Brexit negotiations, they are not just about the uh, relationship to the United Kingdom. They are also about the future of the European Union. We heard that uh, earlier, and that means uh, for Germany, it has to show uh, that every EU member state is, is protected and that the interests of all EU member states um, are protected. And I think uh, that has been a core strand through the whole negotiation uh, process. I remember, I think partly due to the Irish diplomacy, very early on in the process, just shortly after uh, Theresa May sent the letter to, to Brussels on Article 50, that in internal discussion about what are the three German priorities uh, for the Brexit negotiations, Northern Ireland was already on there. Um, and that was uh, a huge political importance for the German government. Uh, just to give you one indication, when our Foreign Minister Heiko Maas had his first meeting with the now almost already former Foreign Minister Boris Johnson uh, in London, the first bilateral, uh, Maas shows explicitly to first fly to Dublin and then fly to, to London via Dublin and show, yes, we are taking care of the interest of all EU member states. And I think um, this should not be forgotten and is my personal impression that wherever we stand in the Brexit negotiation and when we come to the end game now may it be in 10 days at the summit may it be in November may it be in uh, in December my clear conviction is that that Germany but also all the other uh, 26 stand behind the interest of, of Ireland and that it's not just solidarity but the interest of, of the whole European Union which brings me to my, my second point. What is the specific position of Germany um, on, on the question of the backstop? And what I hear uh, in my conversation from, from the German government. I think the, the first important one uh, is that this is an issue that needs to be solved. Uh, we've heard before about many fudges. Uh, we've heard uh, about the EU's tendency to go rather, you may call it a compromise or fudge in, in difficult negotiations. But I think the inherent realization also in, in, in Brussels, but also in Berlin, um, is that at the point where we are now, the only place to legally bind and put a binding solution to the question on what happens to the long-term future of Northern Ireland and the relationship to Ireland is in the withdrawal agreement. And therefore, the realization of the German government is, is very clearly we need a binding backstop in the withdrawal agreement and there can only be a withdrawal agreement and therefore only a transition if there is a legally uh, binding uh, backstop. Um, and I think this is, this is very important for the negotiations that there is now. Uh, the, the question of Northern Ireland was pushed again and again to the future, but I think this is the point where the 27 um, are saying we cannot fudge this anymore because we all read British press. If ministers like Michael Gough say we can change the political declaration at any point, there's a clear realization we have to find a legally binding uh, a solution. Secondly, on the on the border, how, on the backstop, how it should should uh, should look like. 
Uh, it's very clear also uh, that this is a border not just of Ireland but also of the whole EU27 and it therefore needs an element for the single market and the customs union. And I think that's very important from a, from a German point of view. Uh, if we hear about proposals about the future custom arrangement, it's very clear it has to have both elements. We cannot just have only the customs element or only the single market element. It needs to have uh, both elements at the same time. And now, thirdly, I come to areas that are potential of tensions between Germany uh, and Ireland on this issue, uh, where I, I see at least some point of differences. Um, and the first area of possible tension is the question on whether that backstop can only cover Northern Ireland or whether there's a possibility for a hybrid backstop that covers the whole of the United Kingdom. And here the German government is pretty clear. Northern Ireland is about 2% of the UK economy, and it's some something very, very different uh, to give access to the customs union and partially the single market to 2% of the UK, uh, UK economy or to give it to the UK as a whole without the obligations that are in place for an EU member state. And therefore, I think uh, the German government and I believe also the other EU member states will insist very strongly that for the single market in particular, there can be no backstop for the whole United Kingdom. And for customs union, if there is a backstop that includes customs union, we need real rules for the customs union, which means how do third uh, country arrangements, third free trade arrangements apply to the United Kingdom, what are the future, how is the UK bound by EU customs rule, and what happens to the tariffs that the UK gets from, uh, from goods that enter the EU market through the United Kingdom. And so even if there are some whispers around Brussels of a possible deal inside, I would put caution on the table, there are many, many crucial questions that would still need to be clarified, even if the customs part of the backstop would apply through the whole United Kingdom. And then there's a second point of tension that I want to bring on the table, which is what happens in case of no deal. And for Germany, I think the EU is always a community of law. And as I said, the external border towards Northern Ireland is the external border of the single market and the customs union. And there's a huge understanding for uh, particular Irish interests. But I think in the case of there being a no deal, there will very soon put, be put the question on the table what kind of border controls do, do need to be put in place on the border to Northern Ireland. I don't think that will need to happen immediately from the point of view on the under, other 26, but I think the most difficult moment for Irish-EU relations will come at the point if there is a no deal, and the others will have to insist that there be some kind of controls in the border to the state that now has no formal, uh, formal relationship to the uh, European Union and the Republic of Ireland and therefore uh, the EU as a whole. And I hope with these three points I've given you somehow uh, a broad idea where the thinking in Berlin is going, particularly on the backstop, which in my point of view, not only solidarity, but core interest in supporting the interest of the EU member states island. But I also see a point of tension if we get to the very, very difficult situation of no deal and how we uh, go forward from there. Thank you very much. For questions, uh, if we could uh, indicate, and we'll get a microphone to you, if you say who you are, if, if possible, and if you could address your question to one specific panel member, lady at the back here, um, or to everybody. My name is Catherine Meenan. I uh, just want to ask two questions, both for Paul and on the issue then of immigration. If we have a common travel area with Britain, and immigration into Britain is severely restricted, in the context of a very tight labor supply in the United Kingdom and a potential common labor market within these islands. I'm just wondering what you would see as the implications of that. Can I defer to Katie on that issue, actually, who is a, an expert on, um, on, <laughs> on, 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 Irish, <laughs> on um, immigration in Ireland? Did you want to come travel? Well, I just say one sentence. I mean, thinking, thinking of what we heard about the German reservations, you, you've got interesting implications there, too, about uh, potential tension. The common travel area gives, gives those freedoms, and I was making notes as I was listening about the migration effects. What about the Irish effects? Because you, you, it'll, how will it affect our labour markets, for example? 
and uh, how is it going to affect immigration through Ireland to, to the UK? Yeah. Well, what, I, what I would be assuming then in that context is that we would provide a kind of replacement, mm -hmm. and that we would, Irish people would go to, to Britain to mm -hmm. get these jobs, which would be nominally low pay, but would now be much better pay, mm -hmm. and those, those jobs here would be, would be taken by nationals from the UK. Yeah, well, through the Common Travel Agreement, obviously Irish citizens can, can work and travel and take up these positions And in the UK. The other suggestions that the UK government has made for filling up the low-skilled routes are a proposed youth mobility scheme as well, that which would allow, allow um, young people across the EU to access these lower-skilled jobs, and also through uh, family um, migration as well, which um, EU citizens would be entitled to bring family members over as well. But yes, you're absolutely right with a common travel agreement in place that removes some of the, the concerns of you know, friction um, between the, the UK and um, Irish citizens. And yes, it may very well be the case that, um, that they are looking towards Irish citizens to come to the UK to help fill these key industries. Yeah, thanks. Did you Gentleman in front. Sorry. Thank you, Bobby McDonough. Um, I'm sorry, this question is for Eve as well, um, although thanks to all the presenters. But your eight points were extraordinarily convincing um, uh, about the effect of the new migration rules that are planned. And my question is, um, can you explain how on earth those points are not better understood and assimilated in British public debate? I mean, we're used to this country, uh, and likewise in Germany, and, and I think in Scotland, to rational debate. But how, how is it possible that a case that is so overwhelmingly convincing um, has so little traction in the British media? That's an excellent question. Um, there are many sectors within the UK who are arguing these points. Um, business <laughs> sectors are arguing these points. Um, unions are arguing these points. Third sector organisations are arguing these points. The Scottish Government is arguing these points as well. Um, unfortunately, I think that a lot of the, the immigration policy proposals are not based on economic arguments. They're not looking at the, the key sectors in the economy. I think they're based on political arguments. And I think they're designed to try and assuage these voters who were concerned about cheap labor coming in and stealing their jobs. And that's why they have focused on um, slashing low-skilled migration. So I think these are very political calculations. I think they're going to be hugely damaging for the British economy. Um, but I think it's very much a symptom of what the panel has been discussing so far about Brexit essentially being a political crisis within the UK Conservative Party. And that's where the focus has been. And unfortunately, they are not listening to these masses of sectors and voices within the UK at the moment. They're ploughing ahead. Thanks. I won't ask another question okay, because you, you won't allow me to, but just to say it, it's, a, it's a comment on the British media that these points are not understood. Gentleman at the back. Can, can I take it that Nikolai's last point in effect says that in the event of no deal, the backstop is off the table? Except, except of course, for the common travel area. But, but, but I understood you to say that if there's no deal, there's no backstop either. I mean, that's, that's a big question. As far as I understand it, the commitment in the joint report in December was only a political commitment. And if there is no deal, I cannot imagine the UK government subscribing to a backstop as it is on the table. No, I asked about Berlin. Hmm? I asked about Berlin. Mm -hmm. if, if there is a no deal scenario and the UK crashes out with any kind of formal mm -hmm. relationship to the, to, the e, uh, to the EU, and the UK as a whole, including Northern Ireland, has no relationship to the single market, no relationship to the customs union, and completely falls out of the regula regulatory area of the European Union. Then, as we've heard from Philip Hammond on WTO rules, as we, as we know from EU rules, there is the necessity for some kind of, of border controls. And I can imagine that there will be fierce negotiations between the EU partners, uh, whether that can be postponed in some shape or form before an agreement is, is found with, with the British. But what I hear from both Brussels and Berlin is that there is a clear rejection of the so-called managed no deal, 
of where there is no deal, but then there's a series of side deal. Mm -hmm. But the expectation is rather if negotiations break down, we fall back to unilaterally measures on both sides of the table. That can try to keep planes flying, uh, but there will surely be a reintroduction of tariffs, a reintroduction of a lot of things that require control at that border. Um, and this is why I, I think it's important to, to put that point on the, on the table, that in case of no deal, I'm afraid eventually there we will come to the point of the negotiations or discussions between Ireland and the rest of the 26, where they will say, this is our common external border, there need to be some, some form, form of control. Um, how that discussion will play out, I cannot tell you that, but the backstop as it is will be off the table if there is no agreement. And that, oh sorry, quickly. So just, just two things in relation to that, like if there's no withdrawal agreement, there's no backstop, mm. so the, there is a hard border, and the question then is about enforcement, and we can mm. expect, ironically in some ways, the initial impact of that will be felt in the Irish Sea, because that is where Dublin will be able to do checks in Dublin mm. port, and, and you'll be able to have the fridge. You may well have lorry queues in Hollyhead, um, mm. if, if not in Uri, but that, that's where it will come, and it will have to come pretty quickly. And another key point in relation to the backstop is if you don't get a deal, you don't have the common travel area protected, um, at least not from the EU side, not allowing Ireland to be able to continue to maintain the common travel area as it is understood at the moment. Mm. Um, so the common travel area actually is very closely tied into the backstop, and the backstop recognises that and formalises that. Mm -hmm. And in relation to the earlier question, the common travel area still needs to be codified, particularly the rights of Irish citizens mm -hmm. in the UK. Um, there's a lot of concern about that mm -hmm. from That's the Irish in Britain. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Well, on that note, we have to end because we're right out of time, so it's coffee now. But please put your hand together for our expert panel. Thank you.